Okay, hello everybody. Well, welcome to Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. This is our 2020-2021 Grand Round series. Uh, the fourth, fourth presentation in our series. Um, this year, uh, we've converted Grand Rounds to a webinar format. And I wanted to say that we have uh, tried to develop four different Grand Rounds advisory panels to help um, advise uh, me in generating a series of speakers that would cover education topics, clinical topics, uh, development related topics, research topics, um, which has also been informed uh, by uh, residents uh, generating ideas as well. Um, I wanted to acknowledge two funding sources for the series um, and the uh, staff members, including Samhar, who are involved in uh, helping to coordinate the series. Uh, we're still revising and sort of getting uh, updates on our comment and feedback process for evaluating Grand Rounds. If you can access the link after the presentation today, please uh, you know, complete the post Grand Rounds evaluation. It's brief and uh, we're still kind of working that through on how we can best get the evaluations out. Uh, one other point, if you have questions uh, for the speaker today, Dr. Sen, uh, just type them into the comment box and I'll, I'll be sure to, to see those and uh, read them at the end to ask uh, Dr. Sen uh, the questions. Um, so today's speaker uh, is, I'm just seeing, I'm just noticing he may have gotten cut out here. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce Dr. Sen and we'll uh, see if he uh, rejoins us. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Svijan Sen, uh, and Dr. Sen is the Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg Professor of Depression and Neurosciences um, at the University of Michigan, and Associate Vice President for Research um, at the University of Michigan as well. Uh, we were just talking beforehand about uh, Dr. Sen had completed his MD-PhD at University of Michigan residency training um, uh, out at Yale and then has returned to Michigan um, and has been there since. Uh, we invited Dr. Sen to speak on the interaction between uh, stressors, uh, genes, and depression. And Dr. Sen, as, as many, many of you are aware, has, has developed a model for stress, uh, studying, has developed a way to study a model of stress uh, of, of the intern year of, of residency training uh, in a large study called the Intern Health Study, which has had multiple uh, sort of results publications associated with it um, in, in high impact medical journals and has been covered in, uh, in news organizations as well. Um, I think if I'm accurate, I mean, Dr. Sen can tell us the truth, but I think the study is up to somewhere around 2,500 participants, so a very large sample. Um, and uh, including an intervention study uh, that was published a couple of years ago about reducing uh, occurrence of suicidal ideation among uh, interns. Uh, using a mobile intervention. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there. I see Dr. Sen has, re has returned. I, I was just going on for an extra minute. Oh, thank you. Yes. Sorry. I don't, yeah. I, Zoom crashed, so you'd have yeah. to, you'd have to, you know, but you did a great job. For no no problem. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll mute and stop sharing and we'll, we'll go from there, uh, Dr. Sen. Thanks. And yeah, hopefully we'll get through the rest without, without technical issues. But I appreciate, um, appreciate you having me and um, I wish I could be there in person. So, um, so yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about this study that um, we've been doing for, for 12, 13 years now, um, trying to understand um, stress and depression uh, uh, during medical training um, and, and what the causes are and if we can reduce it. Um, and I'll spend the first half talking about that, uh, a little bit about how COVID has changed things. And then the second half, how um, we're using uh, internship and stress during, during internship training as a model to try to understand stress and depression more broadly um, through uh, mobile technology, like you talked about genomics and, and other tools. So, um, uh, and then I'll hopefully save time for, at the end for questions. So, um, uh, so there's been a lot written, particularly recently in the last five to 10 years, a lot more awareness about the stress and depression during medical training. It seems like almost every, uh, every week or two weeks in, in our major medical journals, there's, um, 
really poignant memoirs or, or uh, uh, descriptions about personal experiences written about. And, and um, uh, there's really, really powerful ones throughout. This one I'm particularly um, uh, attached to because it was written by one of our, one of the med students in our lab, Rahel, who wrote about her own depression, suicidality during, during med school and how that affected her. Um, sort of in contrast to all the, um, all the, the, the personal narratives, um, the amount of data that we have around stress and depression during training is, is relatively small, um, which, was, which was the inspiration for, for starting the study. So um, our goal is to try to, like I said, understand the factors and, and the, the rate of, of depression and other problems during training. So um, each year um, in, in April or May, a new, uh, in March, a new cohort of, of uh, graduating medical students match into internship and residency in, um, uh, in April and May. They get an email from me uh, around the country uh, uh, asking to participate in the study, about 60% or so do, and we, we assess them through baseline questionnaires. We give everyone a Fitbit to, to um, track them in, in objective ways and follow them um, uh, during that low stress period and then when they sort of get into internship in July and, and don't really know what they're in for and go through the experience we follow them again um, with the technology and then through quarterly surveys through the year so um, uh, we've been doing this for the last 13 years and, and actually up to now um, uh, uh, 22,000 subjects uh, about 2,000 subjects each year we enroll um, at Michigan and at Washington uh, and and uh, at a bunch of places around the country and, and even a little bit in some other countries uh, across specialties. So um, uh, we measure a bunch of things, but I'll focus mostly on depression here today. Um, we measure depression through the patient health questionnaire, which um, uh, most of you know, just nine items going through the DSM uh, criteria for depression. Um, a score of 10 or above on this uh, uh, has about 90% sensitivity and specificity for a clinician um, diagnosis of depression. So before people start in that, that um, period, before internship in April and May, about three and a half, four percent of the interns uh, meet criteria for depression, which is about the same as the general population, in, at least in, in pre-pandemic times. Um, by September, um, that, that rate of depression among the interns goes up pretty dramatically to about 25%. Depression is an episodic disease, as, as um, we all know, and people cycle in and out. About 46% of interns have an episode of depression that we capture during, um, during the year. So, uh, so pretty dramatic increase in depressive symptoms, and it's not, not um, restricted to depression. About any given time, about 12% of the interns um, have thoughts of death or, or uh, suicidal thoughts, um, high levels of anxiety, so across a spectrum of um, of psychiatric symptoms. We're certainly not the only ones to study this and, and we've done a couple of meta-analyses across uh, uh, depression in, in different uh, levels of trainees and, and found results uh, similar to our, our um, primary study about 25-30% of residents at any given time meet criteria for depression and, and about the same range in medical students. Um, and, and we've been finding that it's been going up um, over the long term in, in terms of time. So uh, residents today seem a little bit more depressed than the res residents who trained you know, uh, 12 years ago like me, and we were a little bit more depressed than the ones training in, in the 90s. So um, why it's going up is not entirely clear, but, but we're seeing a, a small trend in that direction. And it's not just um, sort of responses on these um, questionnaires, but, but there, there seems to be an actual physical manifestation of, of the stress of depression. Um, uh, one way we've been measuring it is, is through telomeres. So telomeres are the ends or caps of chromosomes that um, uh, have been uh, advanced as a, as a sort of cellular marker of aging. They get shorter as we get older and get shorter at, at a predictable rate. Um, uh, about 25 base pairs a year is, is how, much they, how much attrition we normally see in, in telomeres in, in a year. And um, in the interns, we saw uh, a much higher rate. So a, the average intern saw a telomere attrition of about 150 base pairs across the year. So from a sort of cellular aging point of view, these interns came in at, you know, 20, 27 years old and, and they left at, at 33 years old. And we found a pretty strong correlation between 
the level of telomere attrition, how much your telomeres got shorter and how many, how many hours you work. So the ones, the interns who were consistently across the year working 75 hours or more had a even more dramatic telomere attrition of in the, in the seven, 800 base pair range. So, um, uh, so we haven't seen how this progresses throughout the lifetime and careers of physicians and, and perhaps some of this reverses, but this, this establishes more, more strongly telomeres as a, as a model of, of uh, a cellular model of, of stress and aging, um, but also raises concerns about the effects of, of the training stress on physicians. Um, we found a, a, a whole bunch of factors um, that associate with the, the pretty dramatic increase in depression that, that we see during internship. Um, uh, factors that we measure at baseline before internship starts that, that um, predict who's likely to get, get depressed. And, and then a lot of factors during the internship experience. Um, uh, the, the more work hours you have, the, the, the more depression you have. And then a lot of program level factors. We actually see a pretty strong variation between programs. Some programs consistently have you know, 70% of their interns uh, meeting criteria for depression year after year and other ones at uh, you know, 10, 15%. And we find some of the factors, program level factors that associate with that, but, but there's still a lot of work to do to identify them. Um, I'll go through, there, there's an interesting story, at least I find interesting stories behind each of these factors. Um, I'll just go through one that, that seems particularly um, interesting and important now. Um, uh, one, one of the factors is, is gender. So before internship starts, men and women have about the same levels of, of depression uh, in that April, May period. Um, but, but women have about a 40% greater increase in depressive symptoms, um, during internship compared to men. And the, uh, there's a few different factors that seem to play a role, but the strongest that we found was this concept of work family conflict. So, um, uh, particularly work, work, work experiences and duties conflicting with, uh, with family responsibilities. And, and this goes up uh, uh, in both men and women, but much more in women and, and mediates a lot of the gender difference, um, about half the gender difference that we see um, in depression. And we actually see this um, a, a little bit during intern year, but actually in the work family conflict um, continues throughout, uh, uh, throughout the early career of physicians. For some of these cohorts, for the first few cohorts that we enrolled, we've been following them annually. Um, and now the first cohorts are now are, are uh, eight, seven, seven to eight years out of, of internship. Um, and when we, we ask them all um, how, they're, um, how they're doing and, and how they're managing the work family conflict and how they use those to decide how much to work. And, and people wrote really long essays about this, which was really um, interesting and important to read. Um, these are the most common words that came out of um, when, when women were asked about um, uh, what they're thinking about and how, what drives their decisions. And, and you could see the, the, the words that came out when, when men answered the question were really different. And, and we see this manifest in, in, um, in the early careers of, of, of men versus women physicians. Um, we find that within um, six years of completing residency, completing training, um, already about 40% of women have stopped working full time and are, many of them are actually not working and, and some of them are working part time, whereas we see very little um, attrition at all among men. So um, uh, for, for a, a, a group of people um, who've been you know, highly successful and, and really well trained to see 40% drop out of the workforce so quickly is, is concerning. And we see even among the in, in this bottom panel, even among the women who are working uh, full time, about um, about uh, sixty to eighty percent are considering working part time or stopping working. So there's a danger of even greater attrition from the workforce. So um, so this is concerning and was concerning at baseline. Um, uh, we we surveyed this panel of of um, uh, uh, physicians we've been looking at annually just uh, last August or uh, two months ago, and during COVID have found that, that COVID, as, as you might expect, um, has exacerbated this gender difference and, and the, the gender difference in, in parental burden. Um, we're seeing uh, 
uh, a lot of the added burden um, that, that's come from closing of schools and loss of childcare um, fall on, on all physicians, but, but disproportionately on, on um, physician moms compared to physician dads um, in terms of reducing hours, um, becoming the primary um, caregiver and, and in charge of primary child care and, and household tasks. So um, we're seeing uh, early um, warning signs that the, the attrition from the workforce that we saw among um, women physicians um, before COVID is being accelerated and, and, and might become much worse um, as, as the pandemic continues. Um, while we're on COVID, I'll talk about that data was from that cohort that we've been following who, who are now in, in early and mid-career. We also looked at the effects of COVID during, in our intern sample and, and um, you know, we've seen uh, reports from uh, around the country for residents and other young physicians uh, about the, the uh, sort of nightmares that, that having to deal with lack of PPE and long work hours and, and, and the stress that, that, that physicians are seeing with COVID and expected a, a, a pretty dramatic increase in depression. And um, we have a, a smaller cohort of, of physicians, intern physicians in China and in, in January and February where, where the COVID outbreak hit, hit China, we did see that. We saw um, uh, on this graph, the, the blue line is the, uh, um, the cohort of, um, of interns who are, who are currently or were working in, in, uh, in early 2020 and, and the, the red line, or sorry, the other way around, the, the blue line, this is their mood, is, is the previous cohort of um, uh, who were working in early 2019 and as a contrast to the ones who were working uh, during the pandemic. And you could see the mood as, as measured by sort of the daily mood score uh, went dramatically down in, in this year's cohort of, of interns in China working during the pandemic. Um, whereas last year, they actually got happier during that time because it corresponded with the Chinese New Year. Um, so we were expecting to see the same thing in the U.S. Um, uh, we surveyed a, 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 about a thousand of the interns who were um, very active in our study in, in um, April and May in the pandemic across across the U.S. and um, and found that they, they, COVID, as you'd expect, affected their lives pretty dramatically. Most of them were, were caring for COVID patients to some degree or another. Um, a, a sizable number had family members or colleagues um, test positive and, and about a fifth of them had to change living situations because of the COVID risk or exposure. Um, but when we looked at the depression, um, this is a, a graph of the PHQ depression scores across the whole 13 years of our study, starting from 2007 on the left. Um, and you can see that the depression rates are, are scores are pretty high in that, as we talked about in that 5.5 that, um, to 7 range um, across the, uh, the 13 years. And then in this little shaded area, um, uh, on the on the extreme right of the graph is is the COVID area it, area. It's uh, April and May of twenty um, of, of this year, and we see that the um, the lowest depression scores we've ever seen in the history of the study are in the spring of of um, uh, of twenty twenty during COVID. So um, we saw sort of an unexpected drop in depression during that time. Um, when we looked at factors associated with the level of depression, um, uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different factors, the, the level of infection, local infection rates, county level infection rates, um, the, the growth of the pandemic, um, uh, people who were uh, uh, personally affected, both getting infected themselves, family members. Um, none of those factors really came out. The, the, the only factors we found associated with how depressed people were was um, work hours and people working longer hours were more depressed. And then people who were consecutively giving um, uh, weeks of care to COVID patients um, also were more depressed. Um, so we asked the interns what, um, uh, what might have been responsible for the uh, improved mood or, or reduced depression that we're seeing. And it's, um, uh, we don't have a definitive answer, but there were, um, there's, emerging evidence that a lot of different institutional programs, institutions around the country um, put in measures uh, um, 
that people have been talking about in terms of reducing administrative burden and um, uh, providing mental health resources to residents um, pretty rapidly in, in March and April of last year uh, in, in a way that was effective. There's, there's uh, a few different um, really nice um, descriptions of what programs that did, including one from, uh, uh, from Washington from the surgery program. Uh, and, and it seems possible that, that a lot of these uh, changes really did improve, uh, improve the experience for residents. We, we got a lot of comments that um, I'm now doing, you know, providing care and doing things that I thought I would always be doing as a doctor, and this is why I became a doctor. There's also a sense of um, uh, uh, healthcare workers being hailed as heroes that, that wasn't there before that, um, that, that helped the, the mood and, and depression. There's also some sense that it was now okay to talk about stress and depression in ways that it wasn't pre-pandemic. So, um, so I don't think we have the, the full answers, but I think uh, one excited, exciting area um, for us and more broadly is to try to understand what happened during the pandemic that might have had this positive effect and see if we can sort of bottle that up and, and, and make sure that we keep any positive effects in the post-pandemic era. Um, so, uh, so in addition to try to understand the, the experience of internship itself and how we can improve physician depression, uh, as I mentioned, we were also using this as a model to understand depression more broadly. Um, one of the problems in, we know stress is a huge um, precipitant of depression in, in our patients, uh, in, in the general population, but it's often hard to study because we can't predict um, in, a, in a general sense, when people are going to encounter stress. So we're often having to study stress retrospectively. We're using this model as a, as a, as a way of, of looking at a population that um, we can uh, study initially when they're healthy and relatively stress-free and follow them through the stress in a prospective way um, to understand um, the experience. So uh, my PhD is in genetics, and one of the, one of the things we wanted to study is, is the, the genomics of depression. Um, the field had been lagging behind for uh, quite a while. It had been hard to find genes, but through these massively large studies, um, uh, now about a million people uh, through the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, 23andMe, um, studies that compare just people who have depression versus controls have, have um, uh, found a growing number of, of genetic loci um, sites across the genome now up to, I think, 170 uh, uh, loci that um, associate with depression, and each one, each the effect of each individual locus is very small. But um, through a technique called polygenic risk scores, you can add the risk across all 20 million sites across the genome and come up with a, a general score of depression based on these large case control studies. These studies have been great for identifying the loci, but because they're so large, they have um, and, and cross sectional, they don't have that much phenotypical, phenotypic information. So we can apply the polygenic risk score derived from these to sort of phenotypically richer studies like the intern study to get a sense of how the genetic uh, risk for depression is manifesting. So um, when we look at it in the interns, um, the lower uh, green line is the, um, across the, the x-axis is, is your polygenic risk score, overall sort of risk for depression, and the green line is how that looks um, uh, at baseline before the stress of internship and the, the y-axis is, is what proportion of people are depressed and, and it's, it's very slight but there is a, a, a weak association at baseline. People with higher genetic risk on the right side of the graph have higher um, depression but it's, it's pretty uh, small. But you can see that relationship between the genetic risk for depression and actually getting depressed gets a lot stronger during internship in the, the top um, uh, internship line. Um, whereas people with, with, with higher risk for depression get um, substantially more depressed than people with low risk. And you can see this polygenic risk score towards the left side of the graph is, seems particularly good at picking out people who are resilient. Um, the, the people with very low polygenic risk scores almost never get depressed during internship. And, and hopefully this can help us understand maybe the, the genomics and biology underlying resilience a little bit more. We can also sort of look at interactions between um, uh, uh, different types of stressors and, and this polygenic risk. So 
Um, this is looking at, at social support. Um, the, the two lines here are people uh, in the lighter blue line, people with low polygenic risk for depression, and the darker um, uh, blue line, people with higher risk for depression. And on the x-axis is how much their social support changed during internship. And as you'd expect, um, uh, on the left side of the graph, people who lost a lot of social support during internship, you can see the people with high polygenic risk for depression had much higher depression scores. Um, uh, they were much more depressed than people with low polygenic risk scores. But as we move across the axis to people who actually didn't lose social support or actually gained support, we see the opposite is true, that people who were high, had high polygenic risk scores for depression were actually doing better. Their depression rates are in the con under the conditions of high social support. Um, uh, they're actually less depressed than people with low polygenic risk scores. So this um, suggests that maybe what we're calling a polygenic risk for depression isn't actually risk, but just um, how sensitive you are to the environment, in this case, the so social environment, and that, that people, the people who are more um, predisposed to be uh, sensitive to the social environment do worse under poor conditions um, and not enough social contact, but actually do better in conditions with a lot of social contact. Um, and and we, we also replicated this in a, in a separate study. In, in genomics, there's also, there's a lot of history of, of false positives and, and findings that don't replicate. Um, we looked at this in a very different sample of uh, retired individuals, people between um, the ages of, of 50 and, and 70, uh, who also lost social support and, and found the same sort of effect that the people with the high polygenic risk score um, did worse under periods of, of losing, um, uh, losing support, but in conditions where they lost, when they gained support, they actually did better. Um, so it'll be interesting to look at this more in, in other populations and in other types of environmental stressors beyond social support. Um, and uh, we've also been using this internship model to uh, uh, get a hold of and, and learn more uh, about digital psychiatry, which is a, a growing field and some really great work coming out of, um, uh, out of Washington. Um, with this sort of captive population of interns, we have a, a, a large population. Um, and for uh, four or five years now, we've been studying them through, through digital psych uh, psychiatry. We have an app um, that asks people their mood every day. Um, uh, and and we, we have all of them wearing a, a, a Fitbit to gather information about their sleep, their activity, and heart rate um, uh, with the hopes of both understanding mood and depression um, in real time and, and what the factors are that relate to depression. And then also, um, as we referred to earlier, as a, as a modes for, uh, for providing um, interventions. So, um, so we can get some you know, um, through this daily mood, uh, uh, observe things that we, we didn't expect or, or weren't intending to. Um, when we looked across our whole um, history of, of the study for the past four or five years of studying mood, we saw one day with the lowest mood by far we've ever seen in the history of the study. And um, sort of relevant this week, that was the presidential election in 2016. Um, saw a, a dramatic drop in mood that, that um, was bigger than we've ever seen before. And when we look more closely after seeing that, um, we saw that almost all political events that have happened in the past four years um, resulted in a, in, a, in a pretty dramatic uh, drop in mood that this was published last year in, in the BMJ Christmas edition. But um, most of the events that happened that were sort of in a, in a direction that, that um, favored conservatives, uh, we saw a drop in mood and particularly drop in mood in, 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 in women physicians and uh, events that, that favored sort of the progressive point of view, um, we saw a rise in mood. So um, we don't have the data yet for this week, but I'm really anxious to see how, how people are reacting to, um, to the election or the many days of elections that, that we're having this week. Um, more to the sort of the overall goal of the study, we're also able to see how this daily mood affects to, uh, or is associated with other parameters. So one of the most important or interesting ones we've seen so far is sleep. So on the left side is a graph of um, people's daily mood and, 
and their, uh, their sleep hours. Um, and, and we can see that there's a strong relationship. The lines um, travel together pretty closely between sleep and mood but we're able to get at the directionality in a way that we hadn't before. So we know, we, we can see that your, how many hours you slept last night is a very, very strongly associated and, and a, with a large effect size affects your mood today. Whereas your mood today affects your sleep somewhat tonight, but, but not nearly as strongly. And that, that um, helps us understand the relationship between sleep and mood in a way that, that is um, harder otherwise. Um, on the right side, what we're finding also is that as much as, um, I think we all know, and there's a lot of emphasis on the absolute amount of sleep and your sleep time and, and mental health. But what we're finding is the timing and variability of the sleep is, is probably equal or even more important. Um, in these graphs, the, the, the um, people in yellow are, are the depressed individuals and, and uh, blue are the non-depressed. And you can see that the uh, uh, variation. So on the top panel, variation in, in your total sleep time uh, is as important as the, the actual amount of sleep you get. And similarly, variation in, in when you go to sleep, your bedtime and your awake time are as or more important than the actual times itself. So um, people who are able to sleep con a consistent number of hours every night and have the timing of their sleep being consistent are, are um, uh, have lower depression than, than people who have a lot of variation there. Um, along the same lines of uh, 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 timing and, and circadian, we're, we're uh, finding a, a huge effect of um, people's circadian rhythms on, on depression. Um, uh, this is a complicated slide, but hopefully it makes sense. We're uh, through that, through the genomics, we can get at um, people's chronotype. So, um, your genetic predisposition to be a morning lark, a morning person, or, or a night owl. Um, uh, that's been uh, worked out relatively well in, in large samples. And what we generally see is that um, night owls have higher depression during, during internship. What we're capturing here is, a, uh, is a, a specific instance of how they react to daylight savings times of, of the, the clock going forward. And um, you can see on the left that um, that morning people, genetically predisposed morning people, don't lose any sleep at all um, when when that happens in the spring. But uh, but evening people um, uh, react much more poorly and, and lose a lose a significant amount of sleep um, during daylight savings. And then on the on the right um, is is sort of uh, when they were sleeping. Uh, the week before daylight savings and when they're sleeping after daylight savings. And, and you could see in the, the, the red graphs, the, the evening people, um, they are uh, losing sleep and, and they haven't fully adjusted. And even on a Friday, um, you know, uh, five, six days after daylight savings is when they finally adjust and, and uh, react to daylight savings. So um, so this is only a one hour change and we can, we can see both the genetic effects and effects on how people are sleeping. Uh, so it gives a hint and, and um, we're looking at this more closely, but how, how people react to shifts and, and other disturbances to their circadian, it looks very different for morning and evening people and might be an important factor in mental health and, and, and sleep in, in ways that we hadn't fully realized before. As I mentioned, we're also using um, the mobile technology in this platform uh, for interventions. Um, uh, for specifically the population of physicians and, and training physicians, um, uh, there's been a lot of interest in, in coming up with interventions to reduce the depression, anxiety, um, burnout, um, but without too much success. Um, uh, there's a lot of re these two uh, reviews um, cover them nicely, but essentially, um, uh, mo not n no real interventions have found have been you know highly successful or have big effect sizes. Uh, very few are even significant, and I think one of the reasons why is that the um, there's pretty dramatic barriers to to getting mental health among this population. Um, uh, what, when we uh, surveyed them, only about um, 15 percent of the of the interns who uh, met criteria for depression actually sought out help. Um, the vast majority um, didn't get any treatment. And, and when we asked them why, 
these were the, the, the reasons they gave, not particularly surprising, but uh, it's hard for, you know, um, physicians to go, you know, see a psychiatrist at two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. And, and even beyond the access issues, there's, there's still a lot of stigma about, um, about mental health in, in, in medicine. So um, we thought that sort of with, with this level of, of uh, stigma and barriers and, and particularly how, how high the levels of depression and mental health problems are um, in this population, it makes sense from a public health perspective to do, um, to not wait for people to get depressed and, and, and focus on tertiary treatment, but take a more of a, a private primary prevention point of view and see if we can prevent depression. So. Um, what we tried was uh, was based on on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, a, a mobile uh, version of it where we uh, trained people on on this version of CBT, uh, Mood Gym, in the uh, month before they started internship through four or five hours of of training um, about the concepts of CBT and how to how to manage um, uh, uh, difficult thoughts and emotions, and we had a control group that that. Um, just had sort of psychoeducation. And we what we found is the people who who had the CBT got significantly less suicidal and depressed during intern year. Um, uh, so this, uh, other others have found that this intervention is not particularly effective once people have, once interns have depression, but it seems like it's effective as a preventative tool and, and speaks to that, that many things might work um, or there's a lower threshold to working in a, in a prevention paradigm than a, in a treatment paradigm. And, and we've been um, building on this and, and doing other, other uh, work in this realm with, with um, uh, mindful meditation, mindful meditation, and other, other paradigms. The other sort of approach in terms of uh, uh, interventions that we've taken is uh, to try to feed back data. So as I mentioned um, and showed some, some previous graphs that we were collecting data across a whole different, um, uh, a whole bunch of digital technology tools and we provide this sort of dashboard to interns so they can see their sleep and steps and, and mood and how they work together. And we've been doing these micro randomized trials. So we um, feed back some of this information to the interns um, each day about uh, how they slept and how that relates to um, how they slept before, how how in, how other interns sleep, and the same thing in realms of of steps and and mood. And what we've been finding is that um, this information can work and can actually change behavior, but it really uh, how it affects them is dependent on their their state at the at the given time. So. Um, when we um, provide a, a, a message, let's say that um, uh, you slept five and a half hours over the last week, you usually sleep um, eight hours, try to get more sleep, that that actually increases people's sleep um, over the next few days. Um, but when this, is when this is delivered to someone who uh, has low levels of sleep or is sleeping poorly, but when people are sleeping well, that, that same message or that same type of message actually does harm and people sleep less compared to not getting any message at all. Um, and we see the same phenomenon for, for exercise and for mood. Uh, so this speaks to the, the need to personalize um, these sorts of interventions and particularly to um, personalize it to the, the individual's current state. Um, so, and that's, that seems to be true for the interns, but, but probably for the broader population. So um, just to, to start to wrap up, um, uh, we focused on um, fa factors across the spectrum of, of different levels that are related to depression, particularly depression in this population of training physicians. I think a lot of work has been done at the individual level and trying to understand the individual factors that make people depressed, but what we're finding and what other groups are finding it, that, that there's things at, at the higher levels um, like COVID for, at, a, at, a, at a broad societal level, but also organizational things at the residency program level, at the institutional level that all affect workloads and demands and, and affect how depressed people um, get in these situations. And, and um, Tate Shanafelt has a really nice review that, that goes through these. And I think um, 
targeting interventions and understanding them at all these different levels is going to be key to improving um, physician and training physician well-being. Uh, there's a lot of groups doing doing this work now. Um, the National Academy of Medicine just released, or about a year ago, released a um, consensus report on on uh, physician stress, and that that um, hopefully is starting to to catch on and and help change things at the organizational level. Um, and and that there's there's hints um, in in some of our data and other data that the levels of depression are starting to um, improve just in the last couple of years. So we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm hopeful that we're um, on the right path to, to improving, uh, Im improving the experience of, of training physicians. Um, so uh, just, just to, to finally summarize that, that the rates are still, have been high and, and are still high. And, um, and the, what I presented earlier on is there, there's some elements of this COVID experience that can help us um, that may be able to help us understand um, newer interventions that that could work and what what people have rapidly put in place during COVID to to improve things and if we can capture some of those things we could improve things for the long term. Um, again, there's factors at the individual program, institutional and national and international levels that are playing a role, and we likely have to tailor interventions at the at all those different levels for institutions for for um, individuals um, for what fits best with them. And then I, I shared a little bit about how we're using this paradigm to understand stress and depression more broadly from a genetic and mobile technology point of view. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, I really appreciate it and I'll, I'll stop sharing now and um, would love to hear any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Uh, it looks like we've got one question already. So given that anger as a disposition and a response to stress is related to health habits and in physiology. Have you studied this? Previous work with medical students showed this is important. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, uh, I haven't and studied it directly, um, and, but I would imagine it would be, uh, that it certainly would correlate with, with mental health problems and, um, and might be a, a particularly interesting target for, uh, for intervention. So, uh, yeah, so I don't have any, I don't have a good empirical answer, but I, I agree it's an interesting and important area to study and, and one that, that maybe we can uh, make changes in to, to improve. So um, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, an additional question. Uh, it would be interesting to know a couple more things uh, about the women physicians who have completed training. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I was, it's, it's, um, I was, I was surprised by how much of a gender difference we see, particularly in the, in the attrition from the workforce. And, um, uh, we see, we see this effect. I, yeah. If, if, please enter in if there are specific things you're looking for, but we see the effect. Can I tell you, there's two specific things. Oh, sure. uh, how many, it's have, so an interest in dual physician couples, how many have physician partners? Was it their choice to do part-time or was it more of a need? Are they finding more depression actually after, after decreasing FTE or leaving the workforce? Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, so we see this, um, uh, we, we have a lot of dual physician couples um, and particularly uh, a very high percentage of our women physicians are also married, are married to physicians. And we see the work family conflict worse in those dual physician couples. And again, fall disproportionately to the women, w women in, in taking the, the, um, uh, the home uh, workload and evidence that that was exacerbated during COVID. Um, uh, I think the, it, it's been, interesting that the um we haven't seen an increase in and actually seen some decrease in depression among the women who've gone part-time um i our interpretation is that this isn't um uh these are these are people who who went through you know really rigorous and and sometimes clearly stressful training and and in a perfect world wouldn't be working part-time or not working that that they're being forced into this by um the the structure of medicine and and uh, 
and the and the culture, but um, uh, but these are individual decisions, and or these are individual cases, so we can't speak to all of them. My sense, and and um, we've done a little bit of work this comparing, um, you know, comparing medicine to uh, to other other fields like um, uh, you know like tech fields and and the the uh, the supports that we give in terms of um, parental leave and and child care resources are much less than um, you know than people in their twenties and thirties in, in in these other fields and and there's some hints from looking across country comparisons that the that an increase in those sorts of resources decrease the work family conflict and the gender differences we're seeing so. Um, uh, so I think there, there's good evidence to try to move in that direction and to increase, um, certainly during this pandemic period, but even more broadly, um, increases the, the resources that, that um, help with alleviate the work family conflict. And Dr. Sen, uh, different direction here. Uh, have you assessed uh, drug or alcohol use in the intern health study? Um, yeah, uh, not recently. We should do it again, but um, maybe five to seven years ago. Um, in terms of alcohol, there was a, compared to the general population, a higher level of alcohol use among interns, um, you know, a reasonable proportion uh, 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 class or qualified for, you know, problematic alcohol use on the audit. Um, uh, but we didn't see much of a change from base, like with, with depression, we see a dramatic increase with uh, the start of internship. We didn't see much of a change. We saw the overall amount of alcohol people drank was the same um, before internship as, as it was during internship in the first couple of years of residency. Um, people tended to drink less often and when they drank, they drank more, but it wasn't as dramatic as a change as, um, as depression. In terms of other substances, um, we don't see too much use early on in the study. Um, we saw some self-prescription. Um, people would either for, you know, co-residents or themselves prescribe, you know, benzos and a little bit of opioids and things like that. Um, and, and that's a problem in some, specifically in anesthesiology and other fields, but we've seen that go down and, and it's a pretty small percentage even when it was higher in, in the, you know, less than 2% range. So, uh, so we haven't seen dramatic um, either changes or levels of, of, um, of substance use and abuse, but, but it's certainly there. And, and, and it, there's some other, not from our work, but some, some other data showing it, it gets worse later on in careers. And there's a follow-up comment to that about substance use disorder as a risk factor. I wonder if that means the presence of substance use at baseline. Does that seem to be associated with incident depression at three months or six months? Yes, it, it's uh, yes, it's it it is associated with with future depression, um, but it's a relatively low level um, of, of people coming in. But yes, mm -hmm. certainly is, and as is other uh, uh, you know, a history of anxiety disorders or. Um, other psychiatric illness. Okay. Um, oh, a question uh, from one of our chief residents, Dr. Liang, another MD-PhD. Uh, wondering if Dr. Sen has seen any differences in genetic signature of susceptibility to different types of stress. Uh, for example, you had mentioned stress of intern year, intern year, which might be more chronic, and political stress, which might be more acute. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, something I'm, I'm really interested in doing. We, we um, haven't done it well yet, but it's, um, I think there's, uh, uh, we've seen a little bit of looking at the same, the genetic signature or the genetic profile of people getting depressed during internship and uh, compared it to other populations like military populations going off to um, uh, deployment and and a little bit with with um, uh, uh, pregnant women who then go on um, at risk for postpartum depression and seeing some overlap between the genetics that predispose you to get depressed during internship and that that gets that predisposes you to getting depressed during yeah in the postpartum period but um, I think that work is still in its infancy and, and figuring out what's common and what isn't and which types of stressors are from a genetic perspective, similar to each other, is a really interesting area that um, that I hope we can get into 
um, in this study and other studies, uh, that's a really interesting direction for genomics going forward. And, and Dr. Sun, you had mentioned about uh, pregnancy. There's a follow-up question as well uh, regarding the women physicians in, in, in the study. Were there differences in, in depression uh, in women physicians with children and, and without children? Um, uh, definitely during COVID, yes, um, we see a, a, a difference there. Um, at base, at, b before COVID, we, we hadn't seen um, a, a, a significant difference between women with children, without children in terms of depression, but we do see a difference in their attrition from the workforce with women with children um, leaving the workforce at, at, at much higher levels. So it seems like that, that is sort of one way of um, dealing with the work family conflict and the, the depression that comes out of it is, is sort of forcing women out of the workforce. But, but once that happens, we don't see the, the difference between moms and, and non-mother physicians um, uh, in terms of gender, but that's all getting worse during COVID. I hope that makes sense. Time for a couple more questions. There's one uh, getting to, uh, maybe this can open up a domain of questions related to the residency experience. Uh, one about social cohesion. Have you been able to measure group cohesion in different residencies as a social support factor? No, but yeah, I, 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 that's, I wish, yeah, I wish we had an open discussion because I'd love to hear people's <laughs> thoughts on how to do that. But, um, but I, I, I'm convinced that it's a really important factor and, and that, um, different programs have different, um, um, I mean, each cohort has its own um, culture and personality and, and we see little hints of it that, you know, if you, if you enter a program with a lot of other people who happen to have depression at baseline, you're more likely to get depressed and, and there's some evidence of mm -hmm. contagion there, but we haven't worked that out fully. I think um, getting at the level of social cohesion um, particularly if we can use the mobile technology to get at that um, would be really cool. I, um, so yeah, so please, if people have ideas on how to do that, I'd love to collaborate. And, and it's a, It was a comment by, from Dr. Wynne. Dr. Wynne, if you have additional thoughts or ideas about that, feel, please type it in. Yeah. Um, but an interesting point. So you mentioned about depression, that's a baseline, because the first thing that came to mind was maybe that's more of, that might argue for more of structural problems within that Program, but that was at baseline even before beginning residency that could lead yeah. to, yeah. I mean, I, I do think there, there is a lot of evidence for this being, uh, or th that structural changes would help. Um, uh, I think what I, what I, so I, I mentioned this briefly, but we do see pretty dramatic differences between programs um, at the rates of depression. So some are uh, a high proportion of their interns are depressed every year and other ones that seem like they have you know, no or very low depression, and and um, and and that that that's been sort of con that there's a pretty high correlation between how depressed um, your program's interns are this year is is pretty predictive of how they'll be depressed next year. So I, I think that's program level work, and we're still early in figuring out what the factors are. But there's some you know um, academically ones that programs that rank high on the doximity rankings of research like like Washington or Michigan have higher depression than ones that don't and, and uh it, there's there's faculty characters but we're but so yeah so I think there are definitely structural and program factors but there also seems to be this um at a much smaller level but something there about how your um cohort and, and how that interacts is, is important one thing we found is that the um uh, ethnic diversity seems to play a role. Like the more non-white interns you have in your class, the less depressed um, the the minority interns are. But that carries over to the white interns too. So everyone diversity seems to improve the mental health of of the whole cohort, um, whether you're you're uh, white or minority. So um, so yeah. So these are complicated things and lots of factors. But um, hopefully we can get at ones that that we can intervene on. And uh, well, one question, I mean, part of, as many of us know, I mean, part, part of residency is just not knowing a lot at first, and it takes, it takes time. Um, and I'm curious, given the name of the, the study as the intern health study, but then 
tracking people for so many years after. Do, do you see changes as people seem to gain some degree of mastery or understanding of medical practice? Are there, are there decreases that's somewhat predictable in large groups? Or can, can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. And, and um, uh, you know, we see some, with our daily tracking, we see some evidence of um, people getting less, their mood getting better as they, as they get longer in a rotation. And then oftentimes when they're switched to a new one, it gets, you know, you start back over. In general, the intern year and particularly the early part of it, um, is, is probably the most depressed or the highest levels of depression that we see during training um, and during, you know, second, third, and fourth year. Um, certainly in psychiatry residency, um, the depression goes down from that 25% down to 10, 12%. Um, but we see pretty big differences between specialties um, uh, at that stage that, that some, you know, um, uh, dermatologists, their depression goes down to like, you know, population levels of like, you know, 5%. And, but, um, but pediatricians seem to still have high levels of depression. So, um, so we see, so, so we see specialty differences, but in general, what you're saying is true. And we see like the, the, as people get, um, older and, and more experienced, their, their depression goes down. Oh, it's interesting. Um, um, oh, a follow-up comment from Dr. Wen. Um, about residency group cohesion. COVID has unleashed app-based contact tracing. Perhaps you could track how much time house staff spend with one another. It's interesting. Yeah. Also, I believe the military has a number of strategies for reinforcing the, and measuring group cohesion. Yeah, those are, those are really good ideas. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we'll have to, yeah, figure out if the IRB will, yeah, work with IRB to figure out if we could actually use the, uh, the, the, um, contact tracing stuff, but that, that's, you know, would be, would be really great. And, and um, yeah, in the mil I think there's a lot we could potentially borrow from the military. So um, that's a good idea there too. Um, well, I, I, I don't see any additional, additional questions or, or comments. Um, I've got one follow-up question, just since I don't see any, we've got less than a minute. Um, is, is there, um, you had mentioned about um, actually, I'm not quite sure I have it fully. I'll just, I'll just kind of pause on it. I don't think I have the question in mind right now. Nope. Sorry about that. Well, you and anyone else, if, if you're, yeah, if, uh, please email me later with uh, other questions and ideas. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you guys in person, but it was yeah. well, really good questions. Well, th thank you, Dr. Sun. I, I think uh, you generated a lot of questions with the group. I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I think we've all learned a lot. And really had a chance to see a, uh, and learn about work ranging from taking genetic samples, analyzing genetic samples through all the way to sort of micro randomized trials. What, what a breadth of research work uh, and very interesting and compelling. Th thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Have a good weekend.